Fungi Part 2. Be able to explain how Glomera macota enhance plant growth. Give an example of a fungal plant parasite. Be able to define mycobiont, photobiont, lichen, crustose, squamulose, folios, and fruticose, and be able to draw a lichen in cross-section. Both plants and fungi are traditionally included in the study of botany, but there are several differences I would like you to look at. Both are multicellular eukaryotes. Both have mitochondria, although plants have chloroplasts. Plants are the first trophic level. We're going to look at trophic levels later. They are essentially what's called primary producers. Fungi, as saprobic, are essential decomposers in the environment. The plants can fix carbon, and sometimes they can fix nitrogen with the help of rhizobial bacteria. Fungi reflect soil levels of nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon. They put it back in the soil and make it into more available forms. Plants have mutualisms with both animals or fungi. Fungi have mutualisms or can be parasites of animals or plants. Chemical cycling is one of the things that fungi do well. If you wonder why the rainforest seems to be so fertile, but the moment you take away the plants, it very quickly becomes desolate. It's because fungi have a tendency to move nutrients around very quickly. The soil in the rainforest is actually pretty poor because there is very little organic matter just sitting around. It gets digested by fungi and returned to the availability of animals and plants very quickly. We know that carbon is fixed by primary producers and is often put into cellulose and lignin, things that are not digestible to us, but certain animals can digest cellulose and fungi can digest lignin, turning it back into carbon that is available for either plants to photosynthesize with or carbon that is available for animals to eat. Nitrogen is often fixed from the environment in a mutualism with bacteria and plants. Decomposers are going to speed up the rates of chemical cycling. In a place with very few fungi, such as the Arctic tundra, things can actually get locked away for a long time. Remember that peat bog we looked at? There's very little fungal activity in a peat bog due to the high acidity, low oxygen, and cold temperatures. This allows carbon to accumulate. Fungal activity determines how fast nutrients are transferred around. You actually want a lot of fungus in your garden. That's going to increase the rate at which decaying matter turns into available matter. Fungi are mutualists with plants. Well, some are. Mycorrhizal fungi increase the surface area for nutrient and water uptake. Remember how we talked about surface area to volume ratios in fungi and how mycorrhizae are one of the best ways to increase surface area. Don't only look at those white threads. Look at the spaces between the white threads that are kind of grayish. That is filled with small mycorrhizae. And those little areas are going to be taking up water and taking up nutrients very quickly. Plants pay a price in terms of carbon and fungi give them nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and water. But given enough nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, plants might say that they don't need to pay the carbon price and may actually abandon their mutualists. Old Maine was funded by a timber harvest. St. Martin's harvested a whole bunch of white pine and was able to fund the production of the long arm of Old Maine. Well, why don't we grow white pine anymore? Well, that is because of blister rust. White pine blister rust is found on our campus and keeps the white pine from growing too large. You can see a picture of that here. Fungal diseases and blights are able to get rid of a lot of plants and are devastating to crops. Every autumn, I wait for the moment that I see that first little bit of powdery mildew on my zucchini plants. It spreads during the cool mornings and wet nights and takes out all of my cucurbits, everything from the cucumbers, pumpkins, acorn squash, and zucchini, ending the season for me. It wouldn't really make me able to grow anything else. It's just that's when the season ends because of powdery mildew. Corn smut grows on corn and it's actually made into this little um, luxury that you can actually buy. So I encourage you to try it. I mean, I haven't. Um, we also see ergot here on rye. That contains a compound called LSD, which can make people uh, pretty high and trippy. It also can kill you slowly. The form in the ergot, causing something called ergotism. Chestnut blight wiped out most chestnut trees in the eastern United States, taking out a species from their forests. These are examples of parasites that fungi affect plants as. 
we can also see an interesting plant fungus plant mutualism slash parasitism. This is a plant that is parasitic on the mutualist of a plant. So that's that's a lot to unpack. This is an Ericaceae. This is in the rhododendron and blueberry family. These little candy cane plants, they're able to parasitize the mutualistic mycorrhizae in the forest and that actually takes nutrients away from the mycorrhizae where do the mycorrhizae get their nutrients well from the nearby trees so it's kind of an interesting story these are fun to look at when you're out in the forest because they are non-photosynthetic plants could there be a photosynthetic fungus well no but actually yes this is a lichen, and a lichen is a dual organism. So there are two different things living here in this Rhizocarpon geographicum. That's right, that species name is actually two separate species working together. There is something called the mycobion, which is a fungus, often in the Ascomycota, and it gives structure for the photobiont, which is an algae or cyanobacterium. That's right, it can be either a eukaryote or a prokaryote, and that gives that little green coloration. The photobiont does photosynthesis. The mycobiont manages to hold this organism together, give it an ability to grow in an area. There can also be more than one mycobiont, so there could be two species of fungus and one species of algae, or there could be two species of algae or cyanobacteria and one species of fungus in this lichen. So these are confusing organisms, but they're really cool. And they're often the first organisms to exist on this bare rock. They can dissolve the rock and create soil. So these were probably some of the first organisms, maybe even out on earth, on the land. Let's look at this physiology of these in a cross section. So these have an ascocarp because these are ascomycota, and you can see asci and ascospores in there, able to spread fungal spores. Those fungal spores are without algae. If you want to reproduce the actual fungus and algal um, symbiont, you would put these seredia. These seredia can reproduce new lichens, so they can fragment off, and these little pieces of dust can go out and form new lichens. The top here is a fungal layer called the upper cortex, and that, that will prevent the lichen from drying out. The lower cortex forms rhizines, which sounds a little like rhizoids, and forms a similar function. They anchor the lichen to the rock and also start dissolving the rock. So that lower cortex and upper cortex, they both contain and hold the medulla in which algae live, and these algae are doing photosynthesis, bringing in carbon and sometimes even nitrogen for the lichen. Let's look at the different shapes of lichen. So first off, you can get those little crusty ones, that kind of grayish stuff, uh, the greener gray, the crustier gray. That's a crustose lichen. They don't have a lower cortex and rhizines. They're just living in a very small layer on whatever they're living on, in this case, a tree trunk. The folios look like leaves, and you can find these all over campus. They're, they look like leaves, and if you actually did a cross-section here and compared it to a cross-section of leaf, you're going to see that they have very similar physiology between folios lichens and leaves. Fruticose lichens form tubes and cylinders that contain the algae and have these really cool branched structures. You can see these on a lot of trees around campus. This picture is good, but I mean, honestly, you're living on a place where there are tons of fruticose lichens around. Then there are squamulus, which form like scales. And those, well, you can find them on rocks. They're not really common around campus, but go for a hike sometime. You'll, you'll see them around. The ecology of lichens is kind of up for debate. So we've got a couple different theories here. The parasite theory is is that since the fungus is forming apressoria, which are these specialized structures used in parasitism to suck the nutrients out of things, that the fungus is actually a parasite on the algae and is holding the algae prisoner. Also in this are the fact that some algae are killed in the interaction. Then there's a commensalist theory. Because the algae can survive alone and because the fungus can sometimes survive alone, it's possible that they're just helping each other out. They're just beneficial to the other, but it's not really a mutualism or a parasitism. And then we have the mutualist theory, which most people go with. Because both organisms get a new niche, that's right, the fungus couldn't live on those tree branches and do so well if it wasn't for the algae. The algae couldn't live on those tree branches and do so well if it wasn't for the fungus. So both populations are increasing, and thus we take the mutualist theory. Most people go with the mutualist theory, but it's interesting to see the other theories of how lichens have evolved.